Rome, January 2015. An unusual event is taking place just a few steps away from St. Peter's Square. An ecumenical conference bringing together men and women in religious life, Orthodox Christians, Protestants, Anglicans and Catholics. This event is being held as part of the Year of Consecrated Life, initiated by Pope Francis, himself a product of the Jesuit order. During these days of meeting for fraternal dialogue, they are getting to know each other better and to understand their differences while becoming more familiar with what they have in common, the commitment to follow Christ in a personal and community-based calling. Mother Teresa was speaking to her novices, her young sisters serving the poor. She told them, your calling is not your work. Your calling is to belong to Christ. This paradoxical phrase made a huge impression upon me. It found its way straight into my heart and then pushed me to move forward. I believe that I can truly say that I caught a glimpse of the face of Jesus. It's as if his face, his peace and his love became embedded in me. He revealed himself to me as an intense and faithful love that was rock solid. I experienced being loved to the point where my heart was completely full and could not contain him. I sensed the need to respond to this revelation of love that filled me with so much joy. When I entered the monastery, I wanted nothing other than God. I had understood that there was love within me that could only be fulfilled by a relationship with God. Since the very beginning of Christianity, men and women have devoted themselves to a celibate life for Christ and the Gospel, living in accordance with the vows of chastity, poverty and obedience. Although this consecrated life, which is both a freely given gift to God and the response to a personal calling, has taken a variety of very different forms over the course of the centuries, it includes three key elements in most cases. Consecration, mission and fraternal community life. In this film, Net for God seeks to introduce you to consecrated people from various communities, churches and countries who have responded to that same call from Christ, to leave everything and to follow him. In 1713, the Orthodox Monastery of the Trinity, St. Alexander Nevsky, was built in the center of St. Petersburg, the second city in Russia with a population of 5 million people. It is one of the most prestigious and important monasteries in Russia. It currently houses 50 monks who have resumed the monastic life following the persecutions of the Soviet period. They live a life of intensive prayer as well as a great openness to the world. Given its vantage point at the end of Nevsky Avenue, St. Petersburg's main thoroughfare. It is true that most of a monk's life is hidden and escapes the public eye. This is the way it has to be. This is the ascetic aspect of the monk's life. However, there is a more accessible aspect, given that our monastery is no ordinary monastery. It happens to be in the center of a major city. We say that God is love, that whoever abides in love abides in God. 
The monks must testify to this through their lives. The monastic community must testify to this love, that it is possible to live out this love, not in a worldly way, as a pleasure, but love as the capacity to sacrifice your life for the other. Here we are, living on Nevsky Avenue, and it is very difficult for us. It reminds me of an old monk from Mount Athos who came to visit, and as he listened to us, he answered, everything is simple for the man who wants to be with God, who seeks God and who wants to spend time with Him. He will always be with God, even if he is in the middle of a crowd, in the marketplace. He will never forget God. That is why the key is to find silence in your heart. Still today, in the silence of their hearts, men and women continue to hear the Lord's personal call to follow Him and to consecrate their lives to Him. Sister Milena is a sister of Saint Clair and the abbess of the monastery in Trevi in the Umbria region of Italy. This contemplative order was founded in 1212 by Saint Francis of Assisi and Saint Clair. All my desire for God was activated within me when I encountered the suffering of someone close to me, when a member of my family became ill. As a result of this family suffering, I began to ask myself a lot of questions, and I felt a great thirst for a rock on which I could build my house. I was 16 years old, and I needed a firm, secure, and reliable base on which to stand. I had indeed already heard about the Lord, in whom I believed, but I began to feel a force driving me to embark on a journey. I felt the desire to seek His face, and He revealed Himself to me with an intense and faithful love that was as strong as granite. I sensed the need to respond to this revelation of love that filled me with so much joy. Not by undertaking some huge initiative. Initially, I did some voluntary work. I went on some pilgrimages, and I did similar things that occurred to me. So I continued to do what I was doing, with this desire within my heart leading me on. I went to senior high school, where I studied literature. I played sport. I took piano lessons. I was living the normal life of an 18 to 19 year old girl. However, I felt this very strong desire in my heart to find my own special way of living like Christ had lived and of loving like He had, to the point of totally abandoning Himself. When I came across the Sisters of St. Clair, I discovered that their way of living out this total surrender was exactly what I was looking for. And that day, I thought to myself, they are like the roots of a tree, the parts that stay hidden, and whose unseen task is to support and nourish the tree. 
fanno un lavoro non appariscente che l'albero si sostiene e che tutto l'albero si nutre. I wasn't running away from marriage. I think I would have had a nice family, lovely children. It's very mysterious, but I was passionate about God. The call to the religious life was revived in the middle of the 19th century in the Reformed churches and the Anglican Communion. Sister Benedict is part of the community of the Deaconesses of Rui, which brings together religious people from various Protestant churches. This community was founded as a result of a meeting in Paris in 1841 between the future founder, Caroline Malvesa, and a pastor, Antoine Vermey. Both Luther and Calvin put great emphasis on the importance of married life. About 98% of our ministers are married, and so the religious life was suspect in our communities, in our churches, as being a means of escaping marriage and as being, in a way, useless. But in the middle of the 19th century, there was a major movement in most of the countries in Europe in all the mainly Protestant countries, but also in France, rather like the charismatic movement later. Women like us, through seeing our Catholic sisters, also had the desire to consecrate ourselves to God in a radical way, but without undermining households, couples who had chosen family life. We had this desire to give ourselves over to serving the poor, to give ourselves totally to God. Father Arno Bonessis is a priest in the Shaman Nerf community, where he is currently head of the International Youth Mission. The Shaman Nerf, which was founded in 1973, is a Catholic community with an ecumenical vocation, and it has members, both men and women, who are consecrated celibates, and also couples and families. I was born and grew up in the Paris suburbs. I had a happy childhood in a large family. As a teenager, my older brother underwent a conversion. He had been very successful in his life, and one day he came back home saying, if you knew how much God loved you, you would weep for joy. We were very impressed by this. So I followed him on his trips to Marian sites of prayer, and through this I came to faith. Arno was baptized at the age of 16. During his life as a student in Paris, and later in Grenoble, he made the spiritual discoveries that helped him to grow in the love of God. There was all of this going on, and then there was also another aspect to my life as a young person. Summer, for example, for me meant two months on the Basque coast with my friends. I knew all the nightclubs there on the Basque coast. Every night we went out to a club until four in the morning. A bit like two worlds that coexisted, which did not quite fit together. So this desire for the consecrated life grew in me, and I thought, this is a question I will leave until later, when I have finished my studies. But then, during my studies, I did a weekend anyway, at Oatcombe Abbey, and during that weekend there was a priest who was talking about the Gospel of John, chapter 21, 
the miraculous catch of fishes near the shore of the lake. And in this miraculous catch, there is John who says to Peter, It is the Lord. And Peter right then puts on some clothes and jumps into the water. And the priest commented by saying, And Peter did not say, Wait, we can't be sure, we'll go closer to the boat to see if it's him. He jumped in the water. And he said, There are some young people who have the question of a vocation. They have important matters in their lives, but they might say that they must first have an experience experience abroad. Well, in fact, I had to go abroad the following year to the United States, or perhaps they want some experience with a girl, when in fact they do have the question of a vocation, and they do not take the time to put this to themselves. So, when this priest commented on the Gospel of John, it began to bubble up in me. Really, because all the questions he was talking about applied to me, and I wanted to do like Peter and jump into the water. During this weekend, I decided to start a period of training with the Shaman Nerf community, and for me it was like jumping into the water. It was a huge joy to say yes to the Lord, to be able to follow him, finally, as I wanted to. I believe the Lord has put a great joy into me, that of getting to meet others and especially those who do not know the Lord. Maybe it's because of my conversion story, but I often attract people who are far from God. And this gives me a great joy, each time, to go to someone who does not know the Lord and to tell them how much God loves them and how they can trust Him and they will not regret it. The second great joy for me in my ministry is being together with others. I love in the Eucharist at the beginning when we say, The Lord be with you. We do this sign and we're all gathered around the Lord in His presence. And this is something that has been at the heart of my calling as a religious person, to have this experience. And also when I was young, to pray with others while looking to the Lord. And I said to myself, What a joy to be able to be together before our God. What particularly struck me when I discovered the poor Clares was this hidden life, which makes us a part of the church that stays a little hidden. Or if you want to use a comparison with Moses and Joshua, who were struggling with Amalek down in the plain, we are the ones who remain on the mountain with hands raised while there are others fighting in the front line. And also the fact that their prayer life is so faithful. There has not been a single day since 1200, since they began with Claire and Francis of Assisi, when daily prayer has stopped. And it never stops, not on a Monday or Tuesday, or at Christmas or Easter, nor on August 15th. It seemed to me that this rhythm really said something about the fidelity of God's love for us. And with this freely given gift with which we sow, we give life, we offer, but you never know how the Lord will use our offering, where it will make the good seed germinate and blossom. It is not for us to see, but rather to participate in the birth of something new. In this gift, hidden and true, I found my own way to love as Christ loved, including the total gift of self. We cannot hide in our cells. We cannot close the monastery at 8 p.m. For us, the monastery is open from 6 a.m. until 11 p.m. People come to us 
and we welcome them with open arms. What we want is that they will come back to God, that they will regain faith in Christ, that they may find themselves inside and not just from the outside, as when you look at yourself in a mirror. The fathers of the church often compared the Islamistic life to the sea that is full of stones. The stones each have a shape that does not match the others, but gradually the water and waves polish them and each stone finds its place. Thus, the monks, living together in a monastery, are rubbed together and sometimes hurt, yet everyone takes shape and grows in perfection. The element that can unite consecration and mission is fraternal life in community. A fraternal life that must be, above all, human and humanizing, that drives us to become better men and better women. Because if we are not men or women, we cannot be brothers and sisters. Perché se non siamo uomini o donne, allora non possiamo essere fratelli. Secondly, a fraternal life that is born of deep faith in the fatherhood of God. St. Francis of Assisi would say, the Lord gave me brothers. So I did not choose them, but it is a gift from God. And because it is a gift from God, all I have to do is welcome it, and to welcome it as he gives it to us, not as I would like it to be. Community life is obviously a great time. It is like any group that is looking for community, but also marked by the solitude that is needed in a community in order to establish this being one, being unified, listening to the word in Lectio Divina, either alone or in a group. This community life is human, fraternal, warm, joyful. Sometimes we laugh a lot, we celebrate, and we know how to rejoice in our community, as do many communities. We don't get bored, we are full of vitality, but this is steeped in what we experience in our intimate relationship with Christ in solitude. And we are also women of the Church, so the Holy Eucharist is regularly given to us once or twice a week where we live. And this is a very important time before which we might want to ask forgiveness of the sister if anything has happened, as everywhere, such as small conflicts. The Lord's Supper is a highlight where we readjust before God and with our sisters and people who join us. What I find enriching in this call to the religious life, to belonging to Christ and living this special relationship to Christ, is actually, and rather paradoxically, living with families. 
de vivre avec les familles. Because seeing families, families who give their lives, families who live fully their mission somewhere, I have to think there is no radical difference in our calling. We are all radically called to follow Christ. At the same time, just watching the couples with their children, I say they are on a mission for the church, but they are giving. They are with their children all the time. Pour l'église, mais ils donnent, ben, ils sont tous les temps avec leurs enfants. They work for their children. They work with their children. They rest with their children. They have to take some special family time as a couple with the children, with each child. And all this takes me back to my call as I think, but this is just how I have to live my life with Christ. That's how I have to be available for Christ. My life as a consecrated celibate is not from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m., but all the time. In the constitutions of the Chemin Neuf community, there is a sentence that I particularly like because at first it surprised and astonished me greatly. It is a sentence that says, we cannot settle into community life. And suddenly I thought, it's true, I can only settle into Christ. And that is perhaps the challenge there. Do not settle into the Chemin Neuf community. It is being ready to settle only in Christ, to be rooted only in Christ. And we must really understand this, because being ready to move, ready to follow Christ, sometimes means being ready to leave, to move, to change, and sometimes it means being ready to stay, and not to move, to be faithful in the place where I am perhaps hidden, maybe exposed. Everything is possible, but everything is possible because I am attached to Christ, because I am rooted in Him. The Bible text for this month is taken from the Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the gift of the consecrated life and for all those who, in each of our churches, have responded to this call to follow Christ. We pray with Pope Francis that you will inspire them with the blessing of the poor in spirit as they make their way to the kingdom. Give them a heart to console and to wipe away the tears of the smallest. Teach them the power of gentleness so that the Lordship of Christ may shine in them.